questions. And, and sometimes we're ashamed of the questions we ask, but God wants us to ask those questions because God gives us answers. His, his purpose for us, his plan for us is beautiful. And often in those questions, we find the answer that transforms us. I got to tell you, I feel great this morning, um, partially because it's the first, uh, last night was the first night I've slept in a week. Uh, so uh, we were, I was at Broken Arrow with our team, awesome experience. We got a great bunch of kids. Most of them were brand new, so that was kind of new for us. Usually we take experienced uh, people to Broken Arrow, but it was exciting to see, uh, you know, a whole new group. And also I can tell you, I, uh, I had a unique opportunity to see uh, uh, Nate under pressure. You know, so he's got my vote, especially now, as I, I, I spent the week with him in a, in a room with him and a bunch of teenage boys, and uh, he's, he's good under pressure, too, and so, so that was great. I want to remind you once again, if you don't have uh, the, uh, the cup and the juice and the uh, wafer yet, grab one of those. Uh, we'll be doing that at the end of the service. Well, back in 1968, uh, Time Magazine ran what has probably become their most famous cover. It was an interesting cover because it didn't have any, uh, any pictures on it, but uh, it said, it proclaimed on it, is God dead? And uh, man, that was 50 years ago. And fortunately, uh, it, well, supposedly at that time anyway, the, the belief was that God was dying, apparently what the, whatever they were seeing. But, but again, fortunately, uh, he did not stay dead. And in fact, it wasn't too long after that that there began what's become known as the Jesus movement. And so God, you know, came back uh, in, in power. It's kind of like Mark Twain said, the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. When you ask people today whether or not they believe in God, nearly 90% of Americans say that they do. But you got to be careful with that question because it needs to be asked that when you ask the question just, do you believe in God with no kind of qualifiers, like what kind of a God, uh, then you get that kind of an answer. You get an answer of a huge majority of people saying they believe in God. When you start drilling down into them a little more to get some more insight on just what do you mean by that, for some people, God is the force, kind of like Star Wars. For some people, God is an old man up in heaven, probably has a bat, you know, sits on his porch and saying, you kids get off my lawn. That's, that's the impression that some people have of God. Some people say that he's sort of a, that, that the whole universe is God and everything in it is God. A lot of people think of themselves as God. Well, this summer we're asking the question, what about Last week, we looked at the Bible, and it was important that we do that because once we establish what the Bible is all about, then we can go from there. And so today, we're using this Bible to ask the next question, which is, what about God? What does the Bible say about God? What do we believe about God? Well, let's start there. Crosswinds, this is what we say in our doctrinal statement. We believe in one God, creator of all things, infinitely perfect, and eternally existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And right there you have a stumble, right? We believe in one God who is, exists in three persons, Father, or Son, and Holy Spirit. And so right there you got a question. I won't necessarily be able to sufficiently answer that one for you, but we'll get there. And realize that people, that this question of whether God is dead is nothing new. People have been asking this question uh, since the beginning of time. In fact, if you go back to Genesis 3, you find that uh, it says the serpent was more cunning than any animal of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God really said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Now, the, certain, the serpent here is implying that God can't be trusted. For others, it's more of trusting that there is even a God. And so that we have people today who don't believe that God exists, and those would be known as atheists. We have those who say that nobody can really know whether God exists. That's an agnostic. And both of them would say, we haven't seen enough evidence. But guys, I'm here to tell you this morning that the Bible, again, which we've already established, the Bible says there is plenty of evidence. In fact, in Psalm 53, it says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. 
Why would someone, why would that person be called a fool? Because what we're going to see this morning is that there are plenty of reasons to believe in God, at least his existence, if you are really honest about knowing him. In Hebrews 11, it tells us how, without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So that's going to be our starting point this moment, this morning, believing that he is. So let's ask that question, what about God? And the first point we're going to make today is that God really exists. Turning your Bibles to uh, Genesis 1-1, which is our text for this morning. Uh, well, it's one of them anyway. We've got a whole bunch of them today. But it says basically this, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, it's important to recognize from that verse anyway, the, the, the first four ver- words of, that, of, of the Bible, in the beginning, God. The Bible never attempts to prove God. It assumes right from the start that God exists. In fact, nobody at that time really questioned the existence of God or gods. Better, they would ask the question, what is God like? Or how can I relate to him? But since atheism has risen, particularly in our Western culture, we now have people attempting or, or doing this fairly decent job of proving the existence of God through logical arguments. And so you have the whole discipline of uh, apologetics where you find proofs for God. And, and people have used this to prove God, but I would say that it's probably had somewhat limited success. You see, in the end, Christianity and atheism require faith. In Christianity, you believe that there is a God because ultimately you're you're not going to be able to prove it scientifically, but atheism is the same way. That's why if you go, when I was in college, I used to go to debates between atheists and and, uh, Christians or atheists and other belief systems, and and everybody seemed to win because if you have either one of those positions, you basically have a faith position. I believe that there's nothing or I believe that there is something. The thing is, what apologetics I find is good for is that if somebody is truly seeking God, and that was me, the proofs can be the thing that actually pushed them over the edge, which is exactly what happened to me. I was questioning. I I, I had this sense that there was a God, but I I, I just was kind of balking at the whole point of, do I really want to just stake my whole life on a belief system? And then I went to a conference where Josh McDowell was speaking. He talked about how we can be confident of the Word of God, how we can be confident in what we see, and many of those things I'm going to share with you today. But that's all it took for me. That pushed me over the edge. It's also an encouragement for those of us who do believe. In case there's those times when you start to wonder, is is this really true? It can can give you and I a lot of confidence in what we are believing. The goal of the Christian faith, guys, has never been to prove the existence of God. The goal of the Christian faith is to introduce us to a relationship with God. And it's that relationship with God through Jesus that makes the difference. We'll be looking at Jesus next week. The the fact is, guys, everybody believes in something, and in fact, ultimately, everyone's going to believe in God. The people in hell believe in God. In James 2.19, we have this, you believe that God is one. Well, you do well. The demons also believe, and they shudder. So what is the impact of this belief? It's this, guys. If God really exists, and he does, then we are never alone. This past week, we have a, they always have a a campfire on Thursday nights, and kids go up and they share, and and one of the biggest struggles on the res, and probably teenagers in general, but one of the biggest struggles that we heard that night was how lonely people were, and how nobody understood them, and then they found at Broken Arrow Bible Ranch that there is a God who loves them. If there's nobody else, there's a God who loves them so much that he sent his own son, And they said, that's enough if there were nobody else. But of course, they're at camp and they realize there's a lot more people called the church of Jesus Christ that also care about me. And so when the Bible says here in the beginning, it's telling us that right there, that before anything else was, God was. He's there. He was self-existent. He is eternal. He is everywhere. David put it this way. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. 
If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. Now, guys, if you say that you believe God's really exist, the question I would ask you as I've been asking myself all week. It's been a, exciting to be studying about God while I'm speaking to young people about their relationship with Jesus Christ. Because it causes me to think, okay, if, if what David is saying here is true, and it is, and if that's who God is, do I believe that I'm never alone? Or do I have those times when I'm thinking that everyone's against me and nobody understands me? And think about that. Do you ever believe you're alone? Do you ever, you ever forget that God is there? And how is that seen in your life? Does it make a difference in how your life is lived to know that when you're in trouble, God is there? Do you talk to him? Do you have a relationship with him? You see, Christianity is more than just a belief system. We sometimes in the West tend to, to, to boil it down to just a set of, of beliefs and creeds and doctrinal statements. But again, as we saw, the demons believe in God, but what good does it do them? Guys, it's about a love relationship with God. And so God has always been, as it said, in the beginning, and God is everywhere. But the question now we ask is, what kind of a being is he anyway? And if you turn in your Bibles to John 4, 24, we'll look at that one. And what we see is that God is spirit. A couple of weeks ago when Nate spoke, he talked about that conversation that Jesus had with the woman at the well in uh, John chapter 4. And that's where I'm having you turn. And you might remember that when Jesus is talking to this woman, they're talking at one point about the nature of God. It was kind of, uh, we, I often use that passage as do many uh, pastors to, to talk about how to share your faith. And one of the things that the woman does is when you're talking to people about God, they'll often do this is they'll, they'll try to deflect the conversation. So, you know, we're, we're talking about their life and that can get a little uncomfortable for people. And so suddenly somebody will ask a question like, so how did Noah get all those animals on the ark? Or uh, did, uh, uh, did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? You know, I mean, questions like that. Trying to deflect the conversation because it's getting a little bit close. Well, the woman in the well did that because she starts talking about the nature of God. Let's, let's talk about that. It's much more comfortable than talking about me and my formerly five husbands and the man that I'm living with now that's not my husband. And what does John, uh, Jesus say in John, verse 20, John 4, 24? He says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Okay, so what does it mean when Jesus says God is spirit? Well, it means that God isn't physical, that he cannot be experienced through our senses, although he has made himself known, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. He's made himself known in, in his essence, but, but as we, we have to recognize, though, based on what Jesus said and what we see in Scripture, that his essence or his nature is pure spirit. So since God is spirit, you got to stay with me now on this, Jesus says the only way we can approach him is in a spiritual way, in spirit and in truth. The only way to experience God is spiritually, and so we can and should be studying the word of God to know things about God, but if you want to come to God, we need to do so spiritually as worshipers. You could say, in a sense, those are God's terms. In the van this week, we took out one of the seats of the van that we took in order to pack stuff there. And we packed really nice stuff there like pillows and blankets. And so naturally, somebody wants to sit in that seat, much better than the other seats in the van. And, uh, and Nate said, no, you're not sitting in that seat that doesn't exist, okay? You got to sit in a seat. You got to put a seatbelt on. That was Nate's terms. And God gives us his terms. And so we don't go to God under my terms. People who demand, you hear, you see, that God act or that God performed, perform for them, they're not coming on God's terms. People who bargain with God to get their way aren't coming on his terms. God's nature is spirit. And again, the way to approach him is in worship or worthship. That's what worship is. It's declaring who God is in spirit and in truth. But that seems to present a problem because, you see, 
If God is a spirit, then how can we know anything about him? Because you know, through our senses, how, if we can't see him, if we can't touch him, how can we know anything definitive about God? Now turn to Psalm 19 and we'll answer that question as we see there that God has shown himself to us. In this song, David is telling us why he believes in God. He states that the world around us is demonstrating the existence of God. Here it is, verse 1. The heavens are telling the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. If you can turn quickly, go to Romans chapter 1, verse 18. We'll see what the Apostle Paul says about it. I've been at camp all week, and they do sword drills out there. So there you go. I'm getting you all a little, little, little good at uh, turning pages. Paul goes a little bit further with this concept. In Romans 1.18, he says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because, catch this, that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, and of birds, and of four-footed animals, and of crawling creatures. And if you look at societies that have become animistic, where they started worshiping nature and animals, that's the progression you see. They start out worshiping men, you know, or demigods, if you will. And then they start worshiping birds, which they're kind of, you know, majestic. They fly. But then they'll start worshiping, in a, particularly in the Egyptian culture, they'll start worshiping frogs and, and, and beetles and, and bugs and snakes. And, you know, it just, it just gets worse and worse. It's a good example of what happens when men start creating God. In fact, when you want to talk about apologetics, it's actually one of the proofs for God is that as men, we can look at cultures and see the kind of gods that men come up with, men and women, mankind. But, and so the God that we have in scripture does not follow any pattern of any God that any one of us would come up with. I don't know about you, but I, I don't see myself creating a God like God that, that I'm, that's gonna, I'm gonna have rule over me. I, I wanna be the God. I wanna be the one in charge. And so, you know, look at the Greek gods. They're not God-like. They're like, they're like big, powerful bullies is basically what they are. They're very human gods. And so, guys, what Paul is saying here indicates to us why you may have trouble with some people in sharing with them about God because you can't argue somebody into belief in God. And that's why Christians and pagans feel that when you have those arguments, they win. Back when I was in college, again, I had gone to conferences where I learned how to, how to share the proofs of Scripture and the proofs. And, and I remember having a conversation with one of my friends in college who was an atheist and I was sharing with him about the resurrection and how historically you can prove historically that the resurrection is a, is a factual event. And in the end, he had to admit, okay, I guess you're right. Yes, you are right. That there was, you know, that, that the resurrection did happen, that, that Jesus was dead and he rose to new life. And, and he agreed with me. He believed all of that. And I said, great. So how about we pray right now and you become a Christian? And he said, no, I don't want to do that. I said, why not? I've, I've just proven this to you. Yeah, but proving that it's true and wanting to do it are two different things. He had no interest in actually coming to know Christ. The Bible here says what? That everybody believes in God. And yet people suppress that truth because they don't want to believe in God. It's interesting. Many of the great people that we know that are, that are atheists now, people from history, people currently... Uh, most of them, in fact, I would, I would almost venture to say every one of them, because uh, the ones at least that I'm thinking about, they all talk about how they grew up with some kind of a Christian background. 
You know, they talk about they grew up in church and they heard the stories and, and it was only later that they began to not believe in those things. But as a kid, they went to church and they did all the things that they were supposed to do. And so they suppress the truth now according to what scripture says. And because scripture says it, it's true. In 1987, the National Academy of Sciences rejected Christian science, quotes, as science. Here's what they said. It fails to display the most basic characteristic of science, which is reliance upon naturalistic uh, explanations. So they don't believe in anything that, is, uh, that requires a God or God to be involved. Because why? Because God's not natural. God is supernatural. Now, does that mean then that all scientists are atheists? Absolutely not. Many of them are. I've got a couple scientists here in our fellowship, and they're strong Christians for the, for the re same reasons that we're going to see in a minute here. Many scientists believe in God. They, they would agree with David and with Paul. Because they would say that it's the existence of a God that explains what I see in science. There was a conference many, many years ago that Albert Einstein attended, and many people believed that Einstein, probably the most famous scientist uh, in all time, and many people believed that Einstein was probably an atheist, and they were shocked to find out that he wasn't. Here's what he actually said. He said, he's quoted, no, he says, this is uh, Einstein, I have a deep feeling of faith, a deep rel religiosity that comes from my appreciation of the way the Lord made the universe. And it says everybody was stunned. Now, true, Einstein didn't believe in a personal God, but he, talk, he went on to talk about his belief. He said when he was a child, he would walk into a library, and he says, you see all the books, and you know somebody must have written those books, and you see them ordered, and you know somebody must have ordered them. And he said there's a, there's a sense of awe manifested in that, going into a library, where you kind of understand that there's an order underlying everything, and the more you appreciate it, the more humble you become in the face of it. And certainly physicists uh, are, are humbled in the presence of it. And guys, you could, you could say, and, and you'd be right, that the reason we have science today is because of a, of a belief in God. Again, you go to societies that don't believe in a personal God, and you see some interesting creation stories. We've been in the indigenous culture, and it's interesting to hear some of their stories. I know the, uh, the Iroquois, for instance, believe that, uh, that the, uh, the, the earth was made by dirt piled on the back of a turtle. <laughs> and that, the, that the, the, as more and more dirt you know, gets piled on, eventually people showed up. And that's their creation story. We're just riding around on the back of a turtle. But guys, when you look at the order in the universe, you can't escape the fact that there is a God and that, it, that he is orderly. And because of that, science realizes there are laws at work here that we can, we can understand, we can know, and we can verify, and it'll, it'll happen again and again. I like to hike. And quite often on, on famous trails when I'm hiking along, I'll see something like this. And let me tell you, never once have I said, man, isn't it interesting how those rocks got that way? I wonder, I wonder if it was it an earthquake that just sort of piled them up one on top of... Now, I never say that. What that tells me is I know somebody was here before me because a person, you know, an, intelligent, an intelligence put that together. They didn't just manifest that way. The famous argument is, you know, my watch here. You know, it didn't just happen to come together. The existence of a watch indicates that there was a watchmaker. And let me tell you, creation is a whole lot more complex than a watch or a pile of rocks. In fact, Joseph Rog Rogers, who is a, a professor at Northwest Michigan College and is the, um, uh, the, what was very big in uh, ast uh, astronomy, in fact, they have Rogers University there, he talks about... Uh, things that, that argue for the existence of a God or at least an intelligent designer. He says this, if the earth were one degree closer to the sun, we'd fry. If we were one degree further, we'd freeze. If the moon was any closer or larger, the tides would destroy our coastlines. 
If it was any smaller or further away, oceans would die for lack of nutrient movement. If the distance from Jupiter were any greater, asteroids and comets would pepper the Earth. If we were any closer, our orbit would become unstable. If the Earth's surface gravity was any stronger, it would retain too much ammonia and methane and we couldn't breathe. If it were any weaker, Earth's atmosphere would lose too much water and we'd not have the liquid necessary to survive. If the Earth's crust were any thicker, it would absorb too much of our oxygen and we wouldn't be able to breathe, and if it was any thinner, the earth would move and shake beneath our feet and would make life impossible. And that's just the, the beginning of some of the things he says. It's, it's kind of like when I was in college and I took a biology class, and I walked out of there thinking, how in the world am I going to be able to live another day? When, when you really find out all of the complex, intricate things that are happening in your body and have to happen in just the right way... Man, you, if you don't come away with there's an intelligent designer that's keeping things running, you're going to go nuts. I mean, you're going to just be holding on for, your, for dear life all the time. How, how, you know, is my heart going to keep beating? Is this going to happen? Is the earth going to be, you know, stay, stay within its one degree uh, of movement? Guys, uh, there's a lot more proof. That's a lot more proof than a stack of rocks on a hiking trail. As far as I'm concerned, guys, and, and we could go on and on with just this one point, God has shown himself to us. Now turn to 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. Because all this talk of creation and power, uh, with all of that, it's important to understand that God is still personal. In John 14, 6, it says, We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. Because God is love. And the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. Now, notice what this verse is not saying. It's not saying that love is God as if the feeling of love is a, a sort of a God consciousness. That's what you'll hear from a lot of New Agers. It's also not saying that God is loving, meaning that God chooses to love if you perform well, if you behave, if you do the things he says. What it's saying here, guys, is that the core of who God is, is love. Everything God does, even his judgment, even those horrible things that atheists love to blame God for, interesting they blame something they don't even believe exists, nevertheless, even those things are motivated by his love. It is his core attribute. Now, this means that God is a person, but not in the sense, as we saw earlier, not in the sense of being human, but in the sense of having a personality. Again, he's not a force. He's not some, you know, thing that's just floating around out there. He's not a thing. In fact, he's not per impersonal at all. He is personal by nature because he is love. So if God is love, and you've got to follow carefully and maybe take some notes on this or, or talk to me afterwards or think a lot about this, but if God is love, what is required for love? If you break love down, you need a subject for love, right? You need a person that is going to be loved, and you need an object. That is the person who is going to do the loving. But remember, God existed before anything, before anybody else was around, so how then can God be love if he doesn't have an object of his love? Well, that goes to the point of God being three, the plurality of persons. And that made it possible when there was only God that love was possible because there were three. God was the subject and the object of his love. Oh, you get that? Is this blowing your mind? <laughs> okay, we're talking about God here, so, and, and I'm giving you just, we're just scratching the surface of what we could be talking about today. But if you think about it, it makes sense. If God isn't plural, then he can't love, and he can't be personal, and he can't be loving in, in relation to his creation, and that's us. It's interesting that when you go to that first verse in the Bible, Genesis 1.1, and the word there for God is the Hebrew word Elohim, and the idea there is that that is a plural word. In, in Hebrew, you have singular, you have dual, and you have plural, and that's what it is. So in the beginning, it says, God's created the heaven and, and the earth. That's why we believe that God has revealed himself in those three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As Christians, we call it the Trinity. Now, I know the argument uh, from some is that Trinity just doesn't exist. The, the word Trinity isn't in the Bible. That's because 
The word Trinity is describing what we do see in the Bible. God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, and we'll get more into them as we get to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, when we ask that question, all share the same attributes of God. So God is personal. He has a personality. And because God is love, he loves, and impersonal forces don't love things. Whew. Now think about that for the next uh, 50 years or so to, to get it totally figured out. Of course, the question here for us is, do you believe this? Remember, without faith, it's impossible to please God. You're never going to intellectualize your way into faith because faith doesn't require that. It requires it only to the extent that you realize this is worthy of my faith. You know, we were telling the, uh, the I was talking to the kids uh, this week at one point, and we were talking about, do you ever, do you ever uh, think about checking out the pilot that's flying the plane that you get into? Did you ever, did you look at the seat that you sat down on a few minutes ago? No, we don't do those things. We exercise faith. Faith is something that is a, a, as normal as eating and sleeping for us. And yet when it comes to God, people seem to have issues with it. God is personal. Of course, the question is, what do we believe? Do you believe this? Who do you turn to? for love and for acceptance? Is it your parents or your family or your friends or your coworkers, or is it God himself? And there's nothing wrong with all of those, but do you turn to God as our primary source of love and acceptance? And so when we ask this question, what about God? We've seen first off that God really exists, that God is spirit, that he has shown himself to us, and that he is still personal. And finally, one more, turn to 1 Chronicles 29, 11 for our final truth this morning of just scratching the surface about God, and that is that our God is amazing. And I could have used any number of adjectives there. I chose amazing. This, of course, in 1 Chronicles 29, is part of the prayer of David near the end of his life. And look what he says. Read along with me. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in heavens and the earth, yours is the dominion, O Lord, and you exalt yourself as head over all. Guys, according to what David is saying here, God is on the throne. He is ruler of everything. He is awesome. But even as awesome as he is, God is never beyond our reach, and that's also amazing. He is personally involved with us. David said it this way in uh, Psalm 8. He says, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? Guys, God is so amazing, but do you really believe this? In the face of, of, of a tough, difficult, or an impossible situation, where do you turn for help? When your marriage is in trouble, when, you're, when your health is threatened, when you're out of money, when you've lost all hope in your life, where do you turn? Because see, if God truly is amazing and awesome and all-powerful, then he obviously, and as they say, he obviously still takes thought of us, even recognizing who he is, we are never beyond his power. And I wonder, is that really how you see him in your life? Just scratching the surface of God, we see the basics here. God exists. He is spirit. He has really shown himself to us. He is personal, and he's amazing. And guys, if we believe these things, and if we live like we believe them, it will make an incredible difference, not only in our lives, but in the lives of those people that are in our worlds, those people that you're praying for on these cards, as you're looking for opportunities to impact their lives and to make a difference in their lives. It, it, again, pr planning for this message this week during last week was tremendous for me because I'm spending time just getting to know God and the attributes and how do I boil this down into 25 or 30 minutes, you know, and we're talking God here. And, and it just, it, it energized me before going to speak to teenagers about the basics of the Christian life. And so guys, as I said last week, Knowing God, the Christian life, is not just a matter of knowing facts about God, but it's knowing God himself in a way that transforms us. It's about that personal relationship with him through his son and through that sacrifice, Jesus Christ. 
And we're going to talk about that in more depth next week. But what I wanted to communicate today to you is this, that there are proofs available in God's word that can convince open-minded people, proofs from creation, proofs from God's word. And these things can give us confidence in the knowledge that God has placed in each one of us. But what is the best proof of all, probably to the people in your world? I, I'll tell you, for my life, this is exactly the case. It's the difference people see in my life. The different way I react to things. That's one of the reasons, you know, big question we, I got last week from kids, uh, Christian young people, was, you know, I'm a Christian and I, I follow God and I try to do the right thing, so why do bad things keep happening? And trust me, guys, when we talk about bad things, the bad things they're talking about is, why, are my, you know, why does my dad molest me? Uh, why are my parents alcoholics? Why am I having to live on the street tonight? I mean, those are the kind of bad things these teenagers are talking about. And guys, a lot of times I don't have answers for them other than to say, God loves you. He's there for you. And they realize that, you know, as they, as they get involved and they get into his word. And quite often what God is doing when he's taking you through those things. I had that same testimony, that same feeling when I was their age. You know, why, why is my mom an alcoholic? Why does she not seem to care about me? What did I do to deserve this? And you know, years later, now as a pastor and as a minister, I realized that what God was doing then was allowing me to, be, to have a position where I can empathize with people that have been through that. In 2 Corinthians 1, I think it's verse 3 through 5, it talks about that we can then go and comfort others with the comfort that we have received because we've been through those things. I mean, there's some of the answers that we get for some of these things. And it's those kinds of things when, they, when your people in your world see you going through difficult things that are squashing them. I mean, they're, they're losing their footing on life and somehow you're surviving it. That makes a difference. That's where they see, that's where they always say, you know, to preachers, uh, don't tell me so much what you believe, just let me see it. Let me see you living it out. And that's true for all of us. There's a story about Thomas Huxley, who uh, was actually the individual who coined the phrase agnostic. So he was a huge unbeliever. Uh, he was also known as Darwin's bulldog. So he was pretty, pretty strong and pretty uh, vicious in his atheism. And there was a house party one time where a group of men were at. And on one Sunday morning, while many of them were getting ready to go to church... Huxley approached one man who was known for his Christian character, and he asked him, could you stay here today and tell me why you're a Christian? And, of course, the guy is a little suspicious, like, oh, you want to what? J just uh, massacre me with your, your knowledge of atheism and all that? So, and, and Huxley said, no, no, I, I don't want to argue with you. This is not a debate. I just want to hear, I, I want you to tell me just simply, what does Christ mean to you? And so that's what the man did. It says all the, the account goes on that all that morning, this man spent telling Huxley about his relationship with Jesus Christ and what Jesus has done in his life and how, you know, he, he gets up in the morning because of the knowledge of what Jesus has and done and has his, his future uh, secure and all of those things. And it is said that as the man spoke, tears were developing in Huxley's eyes. And he is quoted as saying this, I would give my right hand if only I could believe all of that. Guys, people have chosen to not believe. God's word is true. And as we go to our neighbors, we don't have to convince people that there is a God. The Bible says they already know that there is a God, and so they are without excuse when it comes to that question. That's why we share our stories. We share our reasons for our belief in God. Time Magazine's question has been answered many times. Guys, God is definitely not dead. And we are the, the, uh, the example of that. We have the tendency, though, do we not, to get busy in life, to get caught up in stuff with, with issues and troubles and, and even good things. And, and as we do that, these truths that can be an encouragement to us sometimes get lost in the shuffle. And so what has God done? He's designed for us a reminder known as communion. The worship team can come on back up as we come to this time of communion. And again, if you didn't get uh, the elements, uh, put your hand up and our ushers will get them, uh, get them to you. But the communion table is a reminder to us of God's love. 
In Romans 5, 8, it tells us that God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Jesus gave us this memorial as a regular reminder of what God has done in our lives because, again, we get busy and we literally forget about it. I mean, think about it. If I really kept a constant knowledge of what God has done for me and how God is, is there with me and the things that he has done, how could I really get discouraged? How could I really get down? How could I, how could I be in a position of despair? Because he's always there with me. But he knows us. And he knows that's going to be a struggle we have. And so he says, uh, I'm giving you this reminder, this memorial for you to be able to remember it. But he tells us in uh, 1 Corinthians 11:26, the Apostle Paul was talking to the uh, Corinthian church, which was not a very good church in terms of the way they treated each other and the way they treated. And, and, and collectively, we are known as the body of Christ. And so in 1 Corinthians 11:26, Paul says that this is how we go about partaking of a communion service. He says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy way shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a person then must examine himself, and in doing so, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For the one who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not properly recognize the body. And for this reason, many among you are weak and a number of you are asleep, meaning dead. So it's important that as we come to this time together at communion, that we do, as Paul says here, examine ourselves. And what are we examining? Are we, you know, what does it mean to be unworthy to come to communion? Well, first off, communion is a recognition of what Jesus has done in my life, that I have given my life to him, that he has sacrificed himself, and I have taken part in that. And that's kind of what the picture is here. Jesus says, you know, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. And as we ingest those, we're kind of literally picturing that I am, you know, inviting Jesus into my life, symbolically, of course. But that's a symbol of, of the actual reality, that Jesus lives within me. And so if you haven't done that, that would be one way to be partaking in a memorial in an unworthy way. It's like going to a funeral of somebody you didn't know and then standing up and telling stories about him and it's just not true. So, you know, but the neat thing is we can deal with that right now. You can become a Christian right now and then this memorial will be true. You can admit that I need Jesus Christ in my life. God's word says that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. And this table is going to picture that Jesus Christ died not for his sins but for ours. And that as we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, we then open that, the gift that he's given to us and it becomes ours. And he takes up residence in our life. And let me just stop for a moment here, and if you're in that situation, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. Let's pray together, because the Word says if you confess with your mouth these things, you will be saved. Let me give you an opportunity to do that. Repeat after me to yourself, not magic words, because it's the condition of your heart. It's the words that you're saying that mean it, that matter. It's between you and God. But let me, get, let me lead you in that, if that's where you are today. The rest of us, let's be praying for those folks right now. Let's pray. And just pray along with me or even your own words. Heavenly Father, this morning I recognize that I need you. That without you, I do not have life. I'm on the path of death and destruction without you. And I believe, Jesus that you are who you say you are, the sinless man who came to this earth, the son of God who died for me, for my sins, who was buried and who rose again to new life. I believe these things, Lord, and I accept your gift that you've given to me. I open it up through my belief. And Lord, I thank you that you've done this for me. And I thank you that, that I can also be resurrected from the deadness that I have existed in to new life as well. Father, thank you. 
Now walk with me and guide me as I go forward in my new life in Christ. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And if you prayed that this morning, you're now worthy to take part in what we're doing. Maybe you need to put your hand up and get some elements, or it'll just make the, the ones you already have all that more meaningful. The other thing that makes us unworthy, and particularly Paul was writing to a church that was bickering and fighting and arguing, and he said, you know, you guys are so, so bad as an example of the body of Christ that when people come in late, there's, there's no, there, there are no elements left. You know, other people are, are taking them all and eating them, and, and they're not treating each other well. That's what he says, sinning against the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. We don't have, you know, there, there's that... that horizontal uh, element, I'm sorry, the vertical element, <laughs> horizontal, vertical element, and there's the horizontal element. The vertical element is being right with God in order to be worthy, and the horizontal element is being right with each other in order to be worthy. And we can deal with that right now too. It's called 1 John 1, 1.9. It says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness and make you worthy to partake in this table this morning. Now, when you do that, if there's, if as we pray, if there's something that, you know, God has uh, shared with you, an issue with another believer that's here in this room, I'll tell you there have been times when uh, I've come to communion and I've realized that I've got an issue <laughs> with another brother. Sometimes I see them sitting out there and I haven't dealt with it. Well, I confess that to the Lord, and I, I promise him that I'm going to go as soon as this is done, and I'm going to go deal with it with that person right now. We're going to sing a song right now. Maybe that person is here. Maybe you need to go to them even during the singing of this song and ask their forgiveness and mend that relationship. And in doing so, you then become worthy to partake in this table today. So let's do some business with the Lord. We're going to stand together. We're going to sing a song together. But even during that, don't, don't, uh, don't feel like you can't Stop singing and talk to the Lord and, and ask him, Lord, am I worthy to be here? Allow him to search your heart and show, show you if you are ready for this this morning. It's important. Let's do that together. Let me pray, and then we're going to stand and sing. Father, would you speak to each one of us? Would you show us if there is any way within us, as David said, uh, that is uh, not in keeping with what you would have us, be, have us doing? Lord, we want to come to your table in the manner that you've told us to. Lord, it's not about my will, it's about yours. So Father, speak to us this at this time now. Show us that we might come ready and prepared to partake in this service. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.